thanks everyone for coming. Great to have a full house. Also, uh, this is my first in-person conference talk since before COVID, since BC. Uh, so I don't even know how this works anymore because I'm just used to staring at my laptop screen and talking at myself for 45 minutes. So let's see how this goes. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about, and this is, do I win a prize for longest talk title ever? Bridging the gap, how data and software engineering teams can work together to ensure smooth data integration. So that is a mouthful, so I'm actually just going to give you uh, the TLDR of the talk. Uh, so for you to decide, is this actually worth my time? Is this worth paying attention to? First of all, the main conclusion is that integrating data from a new source into your data pipeline isn't just plug and play. That's sort of the conclusion and the premise of this whole talk. I'll cover some of the most important points to discuss when software engineering and data teams work together from a data perspective. You might notice that I'm a little bit biased uh, towards the data perspective. Um, and this talk is for data people and software engineers that work with data teams. So if you're either a software engineer and you have a data team, data platform team, data engineering that consumes the data that you're responsible for producing in whatever system it is that you, um, that you own, or if you're a data person that integrates data and consumes data from uh, uh, upstream production systems, this talk is for you, hopefully. There's also going to be some amount of uh, trauma dumping, potentially. I'm going to use an example from my own experience working at my uh, current company. So hopefully uh, you'll like walk away from this talk with some knowledge about how to handle these kinds of processes. A little bit about myself. I'm Sam, uh, pronouns are she, her. You can find me on Twitter at SP Bale. You can also find me on Blue Sky at SP Bale. I heard that's where all the cool kids hang out yet. If anyone ever wants to start a conversation with me on Blue Sky, please do it. I still don't know what to actually do there. I am German. I'm originally from Germany. I'm based in New York City. So in case you're wondering the entire time, where is this accent from? And you're not actually paying attention to anything I say. This is why. Um, so now you can stop wondering. Now you know where the accent is from. Uh, based in New York City, been there for nine years at this point, which is crazy. I'm a data person. Currently, my title is data engineer, but I've done data analytics, data insights, data science. I've done the whole data thing. So I'm kind of a, a human one-stop data shop. Um, have done the data team of one thing at some point, have led engineering teams. For some reason, I ended up being a director of engineering somewhere. Currently, I'm an IC uh, data engineer at a company called Collectors, which is a third party services for anything related to collectibles. So if you're into coins, uh, cards, baseball cards, whatever, um, vintage video games, we authenticate and grade those items and send them back to you. So the thing that's really cool about the company that I work with is that we actually deal with physical objects. So it's not just like vir virtual data stuff, but we actually deal with physical objects that customers send to us. Um, fun fact, uh, also shameless plug, I run a non-alcoholic pop-up bar called Third Place Bar NYC. More than happy to talk to everyone about uh, the non-alc space. All right, outline. We've got plenty of ground to cover today. So first of all, I'm going to introduce the problem, aka rewind to about a year ago when um, my product manager or one of our product managers told me about this cool new system they were building and the fun that ensued after that. Then I'm going to talk about errors to cover when you're working on integrating data from a new data source. Uh, logistics, infrastructure, data model, application and data flow, data contracts. I know everyone loves data contracts as a buzzword. I don't think anyone really knows how to implement them or what to do with them. Uh, other people say, yeah, of course, <laughs> we've been doing this forever. So I'm gonna just touch on that a little bit and then wrap up at the end. All right, um, I, kind of, I, don't, I try to sort of get you all in the mindset of like what my life was like a year ago. So we basically had our product manager, one of our product managers come up to us super excited saying, we're launching this awesome new feature next month and we also want analytics from day one. We want to see what our customers are doing with this project, uh, with this product from day one. Let's go, this is awesome, data team. Um, and then there's me obviously as a data person always ruining the fun for everyone. Hold on, let me talk to a software engineering team first and see what their data architecture looks like. So let's take a step back and actually think about can we do all the things with the data that you want us to do. More specifically, um, 
this is kind of what our data stack looks like right now. So we have a bunch of Postgres production databases. Um, we set up uh, SSH tunnels. We do an integration. This is our modern data stack. Uh, extraction with Stitch and Hevo. I can talk about why we have to use both um, <laughs> offline. We're using BigQuery as our data warehouse. We're using DBT for our transformation. And we just migrated over from Tableau to Light Dash for our data visualization. If anyone wants to talk about why I hate Tableau and why Light Dash is actually pretty cool, please do talk to me after this. Um, and the project or product that we were launching is called The Vault. So again, we provide third-party services for people that collect things, uh, quite frequently high-value items. And um, a lot of those people don't necessarily want to keep those items at home in their living room because they might be worth a few thousand, a few hundred thousand dollars. So we actually provide secure storage, which is so cool. And if you see the photos, if anyone's seen Tenet, that movie, it's kind of like that, like the, the free port at the airport. Super, super cool. Um, so we basically launched it as a feature for customers to um, vault their items. And there's a lot of data, obviously, that comes with it. Like how many people actually decide to use that vault feature? How many items actually arrive at the vault? What do we have stored in the vault? What's the value of these items in the vault, right? So lots and lots of questions in our entire product and business team was so excited to know all this from day one to just see what's coming in, right? Kind of refresh, refresh, refresh. And um, my task as person one of a two-person data team was to build all those data pipelines. Um, all right, so where did we start with? Just recap, I had the five different categories. Honestly, these are sort of you know, vague groupings. Um, there's, there's a lot of overlap between the different uh, categories, but this is kind of how I chopped it up. So first of all, logistics, AKA who does what, where, when. Um, again, just going back to me being a, you know, the one half, 50% of a two data person, a two person data team, we didn't have a project manager. Uh, I was the project manager. Look at me. Am I suitable as a project manager? I just outsource every single thing I do and every single conversation I have into a Google Doc. This is like, you're like, this is a tech conference. Why is she, why is she talking to us, like, to us about this? But it's definitely something that, um, especially again, if you're in a small team, you're doing the project management yourself, you're also maintaining your existing data platform already. It's something that you forget sometimes. You have conversations with engineers, you have meetings, you have Slack messages, you have emails, right? That kind of stuff, like as you're doing your day-to-day, Sometimes you just forget to actually write down what's the thing we discussed, what's the decision that was made, who was actually part of that conversation, right? That sometimes you just forget because you're like, oh yeah, this person told me to do X, I'm gonna start working on X. Two weeks later, no one has any idea why this thing was actually uh, discussed, how it was discussed, what we decided on. So running node stock, it's, it's my go-to. Like I literally outsource my brain into that. And I always uh, date stamp it. I say who was part of that conversation, what's the decision that's being made. Also really fun to reread that a year later and just like see how far uh, the conversations and every decision that was made sort of diverges from reality at some point. Um, next up, this is actually, if th there's like two key points to take away probably from this presentation. This is probably one of them is establish a connection. Um, you'll probably notice that I'm a very animated person. I'm very personable. I like talking to people like part of my, what I enjoy about engineering is actually talking to and working with different people, right? A lot of times, especially now that everyone is remote, we sort of hide behind our computers. We just you know, put our heads down, write code as engineers. But a lot of um, you know, what engineering is about and data and working with stakeholders is actually there's humans behind those computers, right? And empathy and connection and understanding where the other person or the other team is coming from and what they're actually doing, what their day-to-day -day look like is absolutely crucial and is kind of the foundation of working together and working together successfully. So really just doing intros, who does what? Who's the engineering lead? Who's the product lead? Who are the engineers on the team? Who are the people on the data team, right? Establish that connection, do like a face-to-face -face meeting, actually get on the Zoom call and just, you know, introduce yourself, understand where people are coming from. Again, you're like, this is a tech conference. Why is she talking about meeting people on Zoom? Um, next up, also again, in absence of a project manager, actually establish how you communicate. Are we gonna have standing meetings, like weekly syncs? Are we going to have a shared Slack channel? Are we going to have email threads? Are we going to have Google Docs? Are we going to use Jira tickets to communicate? Um, this is also fun because the answer <laughs> in most cases will probably be a little bit of all of it, right? It, like we never, 
uh, managed to have like the perfect clean cut way of communicating. But usually teams have preferred ways of doing things, um, either, you know, again, Slack, uh, shared Slack channel, uh, standing meetings, or we're discussing everything in a Google Doc. Also depends on your company culture, but actually agreeing on that up front to say this is how we communicate between the two teams is super, super helpful. Um, pivoting just the tiniest bit from the whole, like, I uh, have one big happy family collaboration aspect. Um, let's talk to the stakeholders. What do we actually want to measure, right? And that's usually going to come from either your business team um, or your product team to say, okay, here are the things that we want to measure. Again, for, for, uh, for our example, the vault, uh, how many customers are actually using the feature? How many items do we have? What's the value of these items, right? Those, those kinds of things. Um, and when do we want to measure them? Um, again, our product team came up with a list of probably something like 30 or 40 metrics. And they were like, yeah, we want to measure all these things. And this is, this is me again, like, you know, putting on my orange sweater and going like, hold on. Let me take a step back. Do you need all these from day one? Because a lot of these will actually not be meaningful at all, right? If we're talking, for example, one metric that we have is how often do people withdraw their items from the vault and then just take them and never use the vault again? That is not going to be meaningful in day one. Tell you what, let's give this a few weeks until maybe people actually start withdrawing their items. So I'm not even going to worry about that. Right. And the last point here on this slide is, is the data actually available? I am going to have much more to talk about that um, later on, but just one thing to kind of, you know, put your, put your ears up and be like, um, I can sense some trouble here. Um, is the data actually available? Are we actually capturing the data that um, the, the product or biz teams want, want to track? All right. Um, and then finally, again, going a little bit back to like the, the touchy-feely stuff, how do we keep the software engineering team in the loop on analytics? So from a data team perspective, and this is one thing that I realized as I was making the slides, we're actually not that great at, um, at my current data team, and that's something that I want to do and actually reach out to our, data, uh, to our software engineering team, is how do we actually show them those metrics, those dashboards, those analytics that are coming from the product that they manage, not just the whatever it is they're using, data doc or whatever, right, the, the sort of like system metrics or system monitoring, but really like the dashboard, the product metrics, right? Because for the engineering team that builds those features, let's say the, the entire system to manage the vault, for example, and for customers to su submit stuff to the vault, how cool is it for them to actually see, oh wow, we've had all these submissions to the vault, is this how much um, our these items are worth, right? This is the project and product that we're working on that we own. And here's what we here's the result of the work that we put into it, and we're actually seeing that. So it's not just interesting for the product uh, and business side, but really also for the engineering team. And a lot of times they're not kept in the loop, right? It's literally just the product and biz people that are, look at the numbers all the time, and the engineering team just kind of keeps hacking away. Um, so as a data team, also like show, don't tell, right? Here's the dashboards, here's all the numbers. Look at this, this is so cool. All right, that's it for logistics. Next up, we're going, going to get a little bit more technical. So I'm actually going to talk about infrastructure, AKA the plumbing. Used to be on a team called Pipeline Tech and we'd literally just lean into the plumbing metaphor and have all our system be Super Mario themed. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Okay, so infrastructure, just just like the, the pure, like bare bones, like technical side, right? Where is the data hosted? Is that in AWS? Is it you know some other cloud service? Do we have on-prem uh, SQL Server databases, which we're also dealing with? And what type of data storage is it? Uh, we're mostly moving, that's actually not true anymore, mostly moving in a relational database world. So we have some on-prem SQL Server databases. Um, we have some uh, Postgres databases in AWS. Um, we also have, then stuff keeps happening with like Elasticsearch, DynamoDB, so a little bit moving outside of the, the relational um, uh, database world. But basically the idea is like, what kind of storage is it? Can our ETL tool, so in this case we're using Stitch, we're using Hevo, can we actually use that or do we need to stand up some more infrastructure to pull the data? Like what's going on here? Um, also always fun, do we need an SSH tunnel? Seems like an easy question, but in this case that's then, uh, that's 
our DevOps slash cloud ops team that needs to get involved, needs to prioritize standing up uh, SSH server and testing and everything. So that was me um, spending a couple of hours at least like in Slack, just you know, testing, running uh, stuff with someone on our DevOps team. And, and again, like just keep in mind, right, there's always people behind all these things. There's teams that have other priorities. So how do you actually get that on their roadmap or their JIRA board or whatever it is? How do you get them to prioritize it? Um, I did not actually put this on the slide. Here's uh, point number two that you're probably going to know, but that I want you to take away is, um, you know, running and maintaining production services will always take priority over data reporting. That's just how it is, right? Like I cannot, if our DevOps team is busy rescuing, firefighting some uh, production outages, they're not gonna worry about my SSH server so I can do data reporting. The data reporting can wait. And a lot of times you just have to keep that in mind um, that you, know, you might not be the highest priority and that's okay. Uh, next question, are there dev and prod instances? Will we access prod or read replicas? Um, please make it read replicas, right? Um, what do we have to do in order for the team to actually stand up the read replicas? Is that already part of the engineering team's process? Like, obviously, if we stand up a new database for our system, there's going to be read replicas. Or is that something that's new to them that we actually have to discuss? Um, read replicas, do we need any kind of write access to that? For example, for temp tables that have used. So for example, if you're using a tool like Great Expectations, which is a data quality tool, I don't know if anyone's used that. I used to work on that. There you go, I see not. Yeah, that, that was my doing. <laughs> uh, you're welcome. Um, uh, great Expectations, for example, needs to be able to create views on a database. So that is something that you might run into, uh, where whatever tool it is that's pulling data or reading data might actually need you know, need to be able to create temp tables of use, things like that. Um, so how do you manage that? How do you coordinate that with the engineering team that manages that database? Um, this is also a fun one. Do we need a read-only account? Um, I may or may not have, like, kicked off a data integration using an admin account because that was the only account that was available at the time. And I didn't want to wait on a, a week or two um, to uh, get a read-only account provisioned by our database engineering team. Obviously, that's not the case anymore, but you know, sometimes I go around things to get work done. Um, do we need to stand up service account? Can we access databases without personal account? Do we need any kind of provisioning through Kerberos, for example, right? How do we actually get our hands on the data? Also, how will credentials be shared? Do we have central uh, credential storage in our company? What, what do we use for that? Does everyone on our team actually have access to that? Do we need to be given access to specific buckets, right? And this is, I am only on slide, what is this? 17. And just going back to, this was a year ago, I was 50% of a two-person data team. Like, there's a lot of trauma dumping happening right now because these are all the things that you have to think through and you kind of just like, it's a very stop and go process, right? So hopefully by um, giving you, you know, these loose thoughts um, today, it'll be a little less stop and go for you and you'll be, armed with that kind of, those kinds of questions up front. Um, this is also one of my favorites. When will we actually get access to the data? Uh, when will, will we get access to dev so we can start at least testing the connections? When will we get access to prod? Um, again, from a production perspective, from a software engineering team pers perspective, the system goes live, right? Production database goes live. Everything works, great. They don't need to, they, they don't necessarily need to think about, okay, there are consumers downstream that then have to actually do something with that data and need to test whether the downstream stuff works, right? So the timelines for when things go live and when you get access might actually be looking very different for the engineering team versus the data team. We might actually want to have access to stuff and be able to test it and see if the connection works and everything way before um, the, the software engineering team actually necessarily cares about. All right, that was kind of infrastructure, logistics, infrastructure, the basics. Now we're getting deeper into the data. Now this is, this is where it gets um, messy. Kind of the, okay, we're getting our hands on the data part is sort of, you know, it's all just tech. Um, what to expect when you're expecting, I don't know when I made these slides. Um, what to expect when you're expecting data, right? Um, 
So this is where we get into the data model as in the schema and the semantics of the data that we're integrating. This is where it gets really tricky because as we all know, if we work with data, uh, schemas change, there's ambiguity, you know, you never quite know what to expect, things change, um, so strap in. Uh, first of all, obviously the question, what does the schema look like, right? Columns, uh, tables, columns, if you're working in relational data world. Uh, is there data documentation? This is like, I like to drop that bomb into any conversation with an engineering team, with a software engineering team to be like, okay, so where's the data documentation? And um, at least, at, you know, at the very least, there will be some Google Doc where someone wrote down sort of like tables and columns um, that might not be maintained, that might not be in uh, like actual machine readable form uh, format in any way. If you're lucky, there's a spreadsheet. If you're lucky, there's, um, you know, some other format, but usually, um, you know, from a, from a software engineering team perspective, if they're being nimble, right, they write stuff down, that makes sense, but like, you know, the code is the documentation, right? Like there will be code, um, let's say something like SQL Alchemy, for example, that uh, documents the data model. So do we actually need a data documentation outside of that? Obviously we do, but not necessarily from an engineering perspective, right? Um, and then also the fun part, who owns maintaining the documentation and who owns communicating changes downstream to the data team. So again, even if there is documentation and I, in let's say a Google Doc or a spreadsheet and I change that and say, oh, this column, we're renaming this column from updated add to modified add, whatever, right? How do we actually communicate that to the downstream data team so we can adjust our pipelines? Um, the answer is almost here is data constraints. Will data constraints be enforced in any way? So this is where like the software engineering, backend engineering, database admin world sort of has to really overlap in terms of good database design. Please, for the love of God, we need database constraints to be enforced upstream, like in the production databases, foreign key relationships, referential integrity, do not allow deleting a record somewhere that another record references via foreign key. That, and that's, you know, database, relational database 101 that can be set up if you do it. Um, null values, do we allow uh, null values or are we saying not null? Uh, I actually forgot to mention uniqueness here, obviously. Um, default values, right? What are the allowed default values? JSON schemas, which is a little bit of a contradiction, but for um, JSON elements, do we actually have any way of controlling the schema or is it a free for all? Can we just add and remove keys any way we want? Which again, from a production database perspective, <coughs> from a system perspective, mm, totally fine. We're just storing information. From a downstream consumer database uh, perspective, I need to know what I'm getting, right? If I, for example, have a, a JSON blob that has, let's say, first name and last name of a customer, right? The keys are first name, last name. Great, what I will do downstream in my relational data world, I will flatten it out into two columns, first name, last name. Um, what happens if the uh, software engineering team also decides to add another key for, let's say, middle initial, right? Well, nothing bad happens because I will just, you know, ignore the fact that this thing exists. But ideally, I would actually know that this changes or that uh, middle initial is already an optional key uh, in that JSON schema or in that JSON blob, and I can actually have code that flattens that out into another column. I just threw this in for a laugh. Um, yeah, exactly. Time zones, everyone loves time zones. Um, I am currently working with databases that are in Eastern Standard Time, UTC, Pacific Time. Uh, we're probably having uh, our Japan office go live, actually storing data in Japan time and not UTC. I don't even know what the time zone is there. Um, so that's really, really fun because you don't quite know, like you always have to ask, right? Um, ideally, store it in UTC uh, with like time zones. Um, also thrown in currency for good measure, right? Uh, again, we have offices in Japan, we have offices in Paris, we have offices in the US. We have one field that says charge. It took me a while to realize that our Japanese customers weren't extremely rich, but it was all, it was all yen. Um, and the conversion rate is something like a thousand. Um, so 
you know, that, that takes some time. So currency, obviously, you need, you know, the charge and then you need the actual field for a currency, which should also be controlled value set and not free text, things like that. Um, and then just going back to what I said at the beginning, are we actually storing everything that we want to measure? I could have an entire conference talk just about that one point um, where oftentimes, unfortunately, the, you know, vision and sort of ideal state from a product and business perspective really drifts apart from what the engineering team is actually implementing. I'm um, not gonna go into detail on the exact workflow, but basically our business uh, uh, product teams really wanted to know the one thing, like one specific data point, I'm actually gonna say it, like they wanted to know where an item that we store in the vault would come from. So does it come from our grading workflow? Does it come from a customer that ships it directly? Does it come from somewhere else, from like an auction platform? They really wanted to know that. The engineering team decided that is actually not relevant for running the application at all. It's not run relevant for the operations team. We're just not going to implement that feature. And literally for the past year, the business team keeps asking, oh, can we get the source now? Can we get where these items have come from? And for the past year, I've been saying, I'm sorry, this is not implemented in the application. I cannot report on this, right? So how do we get product, business, data people on the same page as to how to prioritize capturing the information that we actually want to measure downstream? And honestly, if the teams decide or if the engineering team says this is just not, you know, the, the effort to implement this is um, larger than the value that we get out of it, then you just have to scrap it. All right, that was number three. That was uh, the data model. Four. Application data flow, aka what happens when I click here? So now the data model part was kind of static, right? Uh, tables and columns in some sense. Application data flow is really how does the data get created? How does the data get modified? How does the data get changed? Going through this a little bit faster, just for time. Um, first of all, obviously, how and when are records created and fields populated? And this is really, really important, actually. Um, ideally, obviously, the software engineering team will have some data flow diagram or application flow diagram where you see how the, in, uh, the, the application interacts with the data. I actually love doing that even in our existing production systems to so just click, 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 and then query the production database to see what happens with my record and trace that down, right? And that's super important because a lot of times the uh, what happens with the data might not be completely what you would expect intuitively, right? Because again, um, if you see it from a data and analytics perspective, things might just be different than from a software engineering perspective. Um, so really to talk about that, understand how our records created, when our fields populated, would I expect this field to be null? And then at some point, some process populates it. Is this always populated? Will there be a default value, for example? Um, how does this work? Uh, and then next up, what actions cause records to be modified? And this is one of my favorites. How are modification events logged? Do we have updated ad fields or updated ad or updated by or modified ad fields or log tables, right? Again, this is something that from a data perspective, I would expect, like I want to see when things change. From an engineering perspective, it's not necessarily always highest priority. Like, right, if we change, let's say, a customer ID for the customer that um, owns uh, a specific items, uh, item from an application perspective it doesn't matter what happened in the past to that item if we don't have any features that show the history of it it just hap it just matters who is the current owner of this item obviously from a data perspective i want to see for example as a business metric how often do our items change owners right um, so i wouldn't necessarily call it competing priorities but definitely competing um, different perspectives on priorities of uh, you know, logging stuff. Um, if the logs are literally just application logs from a data perspective, can you actually read out these application logs, right? Not my favorite thing to do. Please give me a table, um, you know. All right, uh, this is also deletions, hard deletes versus soft deletes. Oh, I see some, I see some <laughs> like nods here, right? Um, hard deletes, oh my God, so many, so many nods and just like, mm. um, Will it be hard deletes or soft deletes? So hard delete means the record just disappears. Again, ideally there's some logging going on. Or soft deletes, which means the record is just like invalidated. So usually there's a deleted at uh, field, like timestamp or a is deleted flag. 
also real fun. Will old data actually be archived after some time? That's also something I just noticed after the fact that I didn't touch upon with our engineering team. Um, records just disappeared from the production database, from the table, and I was like, wait, 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 what's going on here? And I said, oh yeah, we have a retention policy. If an item is withdrawn, um, we're archiving that record because we don't need it anymore because the item isn't in our system. So we don't want to clutter our production database. We don't want it to grow, um, you know, infinitely. So we're archiving records again from like a data analytics perspective of reporting on how many items have we had vaulted in the past year. I need to know what's there. The records can't just disappear. So archiving slash data retention. Um, Oh God, this is also, this is something I've been working with literally in the past like three jobs at this point. Uh, data migration from a legacy system. Who, who has worked with uh, legacy data in there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, yes. That's a lot of you. Um, so migrating data from a legacy system into your new system. Will there be anything different from the new data that's been um, created? And different could mean either there's gaps in the data. Uh, I used to work for an electronic healthcare record system um, company. And whenever a practice, a clinic would switch from their old system to their new system, they only migrated over patient data from patients that were active in the last two years. Because, you know, who, who cares? Like the old stuff, we don't need it in the system. Again, from an analytics perspective, if we want to know how many patients we've had with what kind of diagnoses over the last five years, 10 years, we need the old data. Right, where do we get that from? At the same time, different could also mean some fields might not be populated, some fields might be populated with free text instead of uh, controlled input. What do we need to do in order to actually be able to run our data pipelines and our analytics and kind of treat the old and the new data in the same way or at least you know, have some way of distinguishing the two? Sorry, I just got triggered. <laughs> um, all right, this is also really fun. Will there be realistic test data? So just going back to um, thinking uh, the, the slide where I mentioned, like when do we actually have access to the system? When do we have access to test data? And will the test data be realistic, right? And that also goes back to data constraints. Um, are we enforcing data constraints on the databases? Is the data is the test data realistic? I have tested against test data that was actually violating some constraints, and none of my logic made sense. And I thought my my queries and my logic in my data pipelines were incorrect, but it turned out the test data was just someone just randomly like dumped some data in because again, a lot of times for um, from an engineering perspective, the the goal is really to test does the application work. Not necessarily, and like, does it show me the right stuff in the UI? Not necessarily, does everything make sense from a downstream perspective? Um, also really fun, and my buddies at Collectors will know I'm the person who complains about this a lot, test data left in a production system. Production system goes live, lots of employees click around and are really excited to test a new system. And how do we know that they're actually just clicking around and whatever they input shouldn't be part of our uh, analytics? Um, which gets really, really fun when you have employees that are also real customers. So which one of their clicky-click is real stuff? Which one is them just going clicky-click? Um, yeah, this is, this is my life. Um, <laughs> all right, data contracts. Last point here. Um, so everything I've talked about so far is, again, um, told from the perspective of sort of forward-looking, right? I am in the process of integrating data from a new data source, from a new system. Data contracts, from my perspective, um, kind of kick in at the point, or their utility kicks in at the point of system is live, what are we doing to maintain, you know, maintain peace um, between the two teams? How do we keep this working? Um, so first question, all these things I just talked about. Um, I mentioned earlier Google Doc, right? Uh, the Google Doc is really just the running doc is just to dump notes, outsource your brain, but how do we actually document all these things that we just agreed on? Um, again, just going back to database constraints, going back to data docs, um, going back to, uh, I'm going to mention CI, CD at some point, right? Um, where, what's the artifact um, that actually tells us where we can you know, point at and say, this is what we agreed on. This is, um, this is what the data should look like. Um, 
And again, how do we enforce those kinds of things that we discussed going forward without requiring too much human input? I don't want Dave on the software engineering team to have to remember, oh yeah, the data team uses this field, so if we change this, um, like it's gonna break something, so I'll DM <coughs> Sam in Slack, right? We, we, don't, we don't do that. We want the computer to tell us when something, when something goes wrong. Um, which leads me to my next point. Database constraints, again, database constraints, or any kind of testing as part of CI, CD on the data producer side, okay? Data producer side, not just the data consumers, not the, just the data team that has, let's say, great expectations running or has DBT testing. If DBT testing finds something upstream in the data, that's almost too late, right? Your pay pipeline might already be broken or stale. Uh, your dashboard might already look off. You don't want that. You want the uh, data producers to be prevented from actually doing something, making changes to the data that will break things downstream. So um, again, data constraints, testing as part of CI, CD, right? data contracts, that's, that's where all that all uh, comes into play. Um, and also in addition to that, how do we actually communicate changes to the data? Who needs to be informed? So let's say the software engineering team decides to actually rename the updated ad field to modify that. Um, and, and maybe someone actually, you know, implemented that uh, and CICD catches it. Wow, we have tests and they catch that something violates a data contract. What's our process actually for then telling the data platform team, hey, we're changing this field. You know, you might want to adjust your pipelines. How do we even coordinate when something goes live? Do both things need to go live into production at the same time, right? The data pipeline needs to change at the same time as the production data goes live. Will there be versioning of data? How, how do we actually do that? Even just the logistics of that sort of handoff um, are pretty, you know, are pretty challenging and, and also just the communication aspect. Are we just making a JIRA ticket for that? Are we calling in a meeting? Please don't call in a meeting. Most of it can be an email or a Slack message. Um, but who needs to be informed? Is it just one person on the data team? Is it a whole data team? Is it the you know, project manager? Whatever. Um, how do we collaborate there? Uh, and then finally also, what's the procedure in case something breaks? So how do we report uh, any issues? And um, what's the SLA for fixes, right? Again. To some extent, production system goes first. If the software engineering team is firefighting and our pipe data pipelines are stale for a few hours or half a day, how bad is that going to be to the business? In our case, honestly, we don't have real-time reporting. We have people that look at our dashboards maybe every few hours, once a day, you know, once a week. Um, Stuff can just be stale for a little bit, and it's okay. The business is not going to end. They didn't even have any data reporting until a year and a half ago, so you know we'll we'll be just fine. Um, but how do we prioritize? How do we have um, if there is a fix needed from the software engineering team? How can we get them to prioritize it, or do they have an SLA that they actually promise to fix uh, any issues? That's it. Whew. That was that was quite a lot, right? Um, so I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, I'm just repeating myself, integrating data from a new source into your data warehouse isn't just plug and play. Again, that was the premise and the conclusion of this talk. Um, the other thing that I think you will notice, and you're probably all just as exhausted as I am after, after all this, there's an infinite number of questions to consider. Every single one of you probably thought of like five more things that I, that I forgot to mention, right? Um, I would actually be really curious to, to hear from people. We do have about 10 minutes for the Q&A, so I'd be really curious to hear from people, like, what did I forget? Because um, I don't think there is like the definitive guide to doing data integrations flawlessly with 100% completion. Um, the, and, and, and again, just to re repeat kind of what I said at the beginning, the key, really, the foundation of this kind of collaboration is connection context between teams, really for both the engineering team to understand, like, why are these data people just constantly bugging us about like capturing this thing or tracking this thing? Like, I don't know what they do with the data, right? No, you kind of want to know why this is important. You want to explain to them or show to them why capturing certain metrics are actually important to the business, important to the pr uh, product. And also from a data perspective, right? Again, why are these guys not prioritizing like the fixes to this? Like, why are they just busy firefighting the system outage, right? Yeah, because that's more important because if our customers can't use 
our product at all, we're never going to make any money, right? Um, and the data reporting to tell us how much money we're making is going to be completely useless if the system isn't working, right? So competing priorities and just understanding the perspectives of the different teams, I think, is the, the key to that. All right, I'm going to leave you with <coughs> one last cartoon. I'd like to point out the fact that they're both facing the same direction now. Previously, they were opposing each other, right? Now they're both on the same page. I'd also like to point out that uh, orange, orange shirt, that's me, is now gently smiling because it worked out, hey, um, product manager is still super excited. They're just so excited all the time. Um, look at this awesome new feature and look at this cool dashboard to track all these cool metrics. And that is actually what happened. Like even with all the trauma and all like the complications that happened, our product team, our biz team were so excited to see, you know, all these items coming into our vault, all these customers using stuff. So, you know, in the end, it's kind of worth all the hassle. Uh, and that's me just saying like, you know, it's not everything that you asked for. We didn't, we only, we kind of had to uh, reduce the scope <laughs> repeatedly uh, down to the ba the basics. Um, and it was a little bit bumpy getting there because you made some last minute changes on launch day to the production data and I had to fix that. Um, hey, but it works, go team. Um, so yeah, just keep in mind, it's not going to be 100% perfect. Don't beat yourself up. If there is some stuff that breaks, some, some data that doesn't look right, some late nights or whatever, this is again just a process between lots of humans um, until chat GPT or the AI is able to do flawless data integrations and I challenge it to do flawless data integrations. Even chat GPT won't be able to do that. Um, you know, until there's some automated process that makes everything perfect. There's always going to be so many moving pieces, so many humans in there and stuff just gets overlooked and, and that's totally okay. Like don't, don't beat yourself up if stuff isn't flawless. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>